Please take your Bible tonight to Luke chapter 24, please. Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. We're going to read verses 45 through 49. Verses 45 through 49 and we'll read them responsibly as we normally do begin together on 45 and i'll read 46 alternating till we end together on verse 49 and as our custom is let's stand together please to read the scripture all of us standing to read god's word together and let's begin on verse 45 ready then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and he said unto them thus it is written and thus it behooved christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, we ask you to add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for preserving your words for us that we hold copies in our hands tonight. And Lord, thank you for the wonderful music tonight and the uh, good spirit in this place, for the wonderful testimony from the Lindermans and, uh, Lord, the beautiful number by the choir. It's just been a good church service already, and I'm glad I'm here. And Lord, we're looking forward to what you will say to us now through your word tonight. Bless the special. Make our hearts in tune with your heart. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. With my whole heart I humbly seek you. Now use my life, O oh Lord, I pray. I yield my stubborn will completely. May your commandments light my way. My life, Lord, is yours to control. I give you my heart and my soul. I'll seek your will, never mine. Rich treasure. Sure. 
And our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer this evening. We come to the preaching of your word. <clears throat> Lord, I need your help this evening as we deal with this important subject of what's missing. Lord, I pray that you would help me as I bring the message tonight. And Spirit of God, please give me your help. I'd like to be a spirit-filled preacher this evening, and I'd like the people to be spirit-filled listeners. We all might have ears to hear what you would want to say to each of us this evening. And so, Lord, help us to focus, help us to give you our undivided attention for these next few moments as we look into your word together. And may your will be accomplished in each one of our lives. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. What if the offering were passed on a Sunday and nothing came in? Think about that. Empty. Zero. What if... Would it mean anything? I'm sure there'd be some meetings held. I'm sure announcements would have to be made because the church could not operate without money. There, there's lights to pay for. There's heating and air conditioning to pay for. There's gasoline to pay for. There's insurance to pay for. There's cleaning supplies to pay for. There's paper to pay for. There's ministries that need to be run. and I mean, there's... There's quite a stir if there was no money in the offering. There would certainly be concern and there would certainly be some meetings out. This just can't do. But there's something else alarming in churches. I was reading the statistics. It's very difficult to get statistics on independent Baptist churches. There's no... Because we're, we're so as the term is, stinking independent. Uh, nobody, nobody can get us together to get any statistics. But I did read some statistics about Southern Baptist churches in 2016. And uh, it said there are 15 million Southern Baptist members. People who said they're members of a Southern Baptist church. And yet the average weekly attendance in Southern Baptist churches in 2016 was 5 million people. They had 305,000 baptisms in 2016, which is their lowest total since 1947. It's been decreasing each year. What's missing? When we talk about mega churches, to be classified as a mega church, you have to average over 2,000 in attendance every week. There are now over 1,300 such churches in the United States. By the way, that's up from 300 20 years ago. It's quadrupled. Again, they account for about 4 million weekly attenders, but they count around 12 million members. There are mega churches in 45 out of 50 states. And yet only 20% of Americans say they go to church weekly. And I don't mean W-E-A-K-L-Y, though that would be included. Weekly is Sunday morning only. Something's missing. You remember the story in the Old Testament when they were building a, well, they were chopping down wood to build a new building for the prophets? And the fella, one of the young prophets, was chopping a tree down near the River Jordan and, and the head of the axe, the axe head, flew off. And it went in the river and he went to Elijah and he said, Hey, I've lost the axe head. 
And he came to him and said, where did it fall in? And he showed him where it fell in and the axe head did float. And so he reached down, picked it up, and put it back on, and then he could keep on chopping. You know the, you know the, the great thing about that story? Is when the axe head dropped off the axe, he quit chopping. How foolish would it have been for him to keep hammering away, to keep hammering away on that thing without any head on the axe? That would have been futile. He would have got nothing done. Because what supplies the power, what supplies the effectiveness of the axe, is that sharp edge on the top. And there's, my, my contention tonight is, listen, what's missing in many of our churches is the power of God. The power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we're chopping. And we're banging. But the axe head isn't there. And so we're making noise and we're, we got things going on, but we're, we're lacking in God's power. The church has lost its axe head. We're, we're, we're serving in our own strength. We're serving in our own power. We're serving in our own flesh. We have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. We're hacking away, but we're not getting anywhere. And God never intended for us to be powerless. You understand, if, if I say churches are powerless, churches are not buildings. Churches are people. And if the church is powerless, it's because the people are powerless. But the Lord Jesus is the one who said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost come upon you and you'll be witnesses. It's the Lord Jesus who said in Luke 24 and verse number 49, but ye shall be endued with power from on high to tarry in Jerusalem. It was the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5 that said, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It was the songwriters in our hymn book that wrote songs like, Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power. Thy floodgate of blessings on us throw open wide. It's the hymn writers who wrote the song, I'll pour water on him who is thirsty. I'll pour floods upon the dry ground. We're missing God's power. Now, to be sure, what happens is we don't want to admit it. We don't like to say we're powerless, so we try to substitute for God's power. And many times we try to replace it. And we tried replacements. The church tries to place it with financial power. You know, the early church had very little machinery, but it had the power of God. The early church had very little of what we think, what, what we, think we need to have church, and yet they made a great impact in their city and town for Christ. A young woman worked in a large umbrella factory in Philadelphia. This was well over a hundred years ago. At that time, it was the largest umbrella factory in the world. She said to her pastor one day in a discouraged manner, oh, Pastor, I need to hunt another job. And I asked her what the matter was. Have they discharged you? She said, no, they have not discharged me. Well, hasn't your factory got enough orders to keep going all the time? And she goes, oh, yes. She goes, it's not that at all. They have more orders than they can fill. But they haven't enough electricity to keep all the machines running at the same time. So my machine has to be idle part of the week. And I lose so much time and pay. The trouble with the factory is, she said, they have more machinery than they do power. The trouble with our churches today is we have more machinery than we do power. The finest machinery made is useless without power. And the finest churches around are going to be useless without the power of God. We can't carry out the Great Commission. We can't carry out the message that we talked about this morning if we don't have God's power. We've got to have more than the Mormon missionary carries. 
We've got to have more than the Jehovah's Witness carries. We've got to have more than the door-to-door salesman carries. And we have more. We have the power of God at our disposal. When the man at the gate, beautiful in the temple, met by Peter and John as they went up to pray, and he thought he wanted to he wanted to ask an alms of them, hoping to get some money out of them. He didn't realize they were Baptist preachers. <laughs> and they said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Bible says that man didn't just stand up, he was leaping up. And he went into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. Oh, my friend, that was the power of God. We look out at a crippled world, and it's not money they need. It's people with the power of God in their life is what they need. That's what they're looking for. All the money in the world is no substitute for God's power. There was a day in... And, and, and again, I, I mentioned this morning that I've been around for a while. <laughs> I've observed churches through the decades now. And, and you know, uh, it, it would be, it used to be, you talk about what a church had for attendance or uh, how many folks have been saved or how many folks have been baptized. And, and that's what you would talk about. And now, the first question that preachers ask when they get together, you know what they ask? How are your offerings? How are your offerings? They don't even talk about missionaries. They talk about, well, we're building this, or we're building that, or we're, we're, we're getting this. What's your, what's your per capita giving day? It, 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 it reminds you of the Laodicean church. We're rich. We're increased with goods. We have need of nothing. But God had a really different view of things. You're miserable and wretched and naked and blind. I'm not saying we don't need giving of God's people. We do need that. But it's God's power that changes lives. So it's not financial power. That won't take the place. Uh, sometimes we try intellectual power. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Intellectual power. 1 Corinthians and chapter 2. Notice verse number 4. Paul writes this, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I'm for college. I'm for preparing. I'm not, I'm not putting a, a premium on ignorance. Certainly not, and, and don't think that. But listen, no amount of intellectualism, no amount of learning, no amount of letters after your name will take place for the power of God upon your life. It's the power. Preachers meet and they want to know where you got your degree or where you went to school or where did you graduate from. When you see meetings advertised now, it's not brother so-and-so or pastor so-and-so, it's doctor so-and-so. Everybody's got to be a doctor. And have a, a doctorate, whether it's honorary or earned, it, it doesn't matter. We we become we, we become to worship the intellect. We become to bow at the education, just as the world does. But you know, it was said of the apostles of Jesus Christ that they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they took knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus. They, they knew that those men had been around Jesus Christ. And they turned their world upside down for Jesus. And it wasn't by intellectual power. It was by God's power. Some, some have tried social power. Who are you targeting? What's your target group? You targeting the 30-somethings? You targeting Generation X? You targeting the Millennials? No, sir, we're targeting every creature. We're targeting every single individual. We're trying to go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. There ought not to be, one, there ought not to be any such thing as a one-class church. There ought not to be any such thing as a one-race church. 
Sadly, one of the most segregated times in America is Sunday morning at 10 or 11 o'clock. And it shouldn't be that way. Should not be that way. We tried social power. We've tried physical power. Physical power. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you're at chapter 2, just look just across the page in my Bible, maybe you have to turn a page in yours. Chapter 1 and verse number 26, notice what Paul writes here to the church at Corinth. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Did you see who God chose? Notice foolish things, weak things, base things, and despised things. You know who that is? <laughs> That's us. That's you and me. And God did that so that we wouldn't, we wouldn't take credit because we know it can't be us. People who know they'll have to have God's power and they'll have to rely upon Him. And they try physical power, but God chooses nobody. The weak things of the world to confound the wise. You know, I mentioned those mega churches, and believe it or not, as I was researching this, I came across a, a top 50 of what they called, this is a group that did a top 50 survey of the fittest churches. The fittest mega churches. Physically fit. Now listen to this. Number one on the list, the top 50 from Health Fitness Revolution. Lakewood Church, Houston, Texas. Anybody know who pastors that church? Yeah. Here they go. Why are they on the list? Well, they offer a yearly total life challenge. It's a class for complete physical fitness and inner peace. They provide a strength and conditioning class. They have Zumba classes. They have nutritional classes. They have a basketball court. Second Baptist Church of Houston, Texas. They have a gym. They have personal trainers. They have fitness classes including core conditioning, interval training, TRX, boot camp, aerobics, spin and foam roller, whatever that is. Indoor, outdoor track, whirlpool and sauna in locker rooms, full size weight room and plenty of cardio equipment, and they have sports leagues. Willow Creek Community Church, South Barrington, Illinois, has a sports ministry that runs several fall, winter, and spring leagues, co-ed volleyball, women's basketball, and men's flag football. During the summer, they offer weekly sand volleyball, running clubs, and yoga groups. Taekwondo classes meet year-round. Saddleback Church, Lake Forest, California installed an outdoor fitness course on its property that is free for the community to use. The half-mile course includes five stations featuring a variety of equipment designed to target different muscle groups. The pastor, Rick Warren, wrote a book, The Daniel Plan, 40 Days to a Healthier Life. The Daniel Plan is a healthy lifestyle program that shows how, powerful, how the powerful combination of faith, food, fitness, focus, and friends can change your health forever. They have an annual Daniel Plan Health and Fitness Rally. They host a Daniel Plan Fun Walk and Run. They have a sports and fitness ministry which organizes recreation, leisure, and sports activities to benefit participants, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Examples include softball, basketball, soccer, golf, badminton, cycling, surfing, hiking, fitness, youth sports, prison sports, karate, tennis, and sports clinics. These are, these are not fitness clubs. 
These are churches. You talk about you talk about missing the mission. Can you imagine the church at Jerusalem advertising these? I could go on. The list goes on for 50 of them. It's not it's not physical power. Well, what's needed? If it's not physical power or social power or intellectual power or our, our financial power, what are we lacking? We're lacking God's power. Ezekiel called it the breath of God. David called it fresh oil. Luke wrote as it being endued with power from on high. Jesus said, you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Paul said, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. The question for you tonight, the question for me tonight is, do you have the breath of God on your life? Sunday school teacher, do you have the breath of God on your life? Usher, do you have the breath of God on your life? Bus worker, do you have the breath of God on your life? Soul winner, choir member, bus driver, nursery worker, do you have the breath of God upon your life? You see, for a church to, to say, I want a church with God's power on it, means that we have to have God's power in our lives. God's power doesn't rest on wood and sticks, mortar and paint. It rests on people. I have no desire to have intellectual power and not God's power. No desire to have financial power, but not God's power. No desire to have social power, but not God's power. When the power is there, then sinners will come to know Christ. When the power is present, backsliders will come back to God. When the power is there, then, then the baptismal waters will be stirred. When the power is there, marriages will be restored. And relationships will be healed. And, and, and we'll begin to see <clears throat> homes put back together. Oh, listen, with the power of God upon our lives, there'd be no abortion clinics in America. With the power of God upon our lives, there'd be no homosexual parades. With the power of God upon our lives, there'd be no liquor traffic. There'd be no pornographic industry. None of that would be possible if God's people had God's power upon their lives. Oh, that we would not settle for what's considered normal Christianity. The Lord said in the book of Isaiah, I'll pour water on him who is thirsty, and I will pour floods upon the dry ground. You see, the problem with the power of God is not on God's side. It's on our side. It's no, God is the same. He never changes. He's, he, 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 I am the Lord thy God. I change not. The problem isn't on God's side. It's on our side. I believe God will still save drunkards. I believe God will still save drug addicts. I believe God will still save atheists. I believe it will take Christians with the power of God upon their life for to see God happen and to see God do that. Walk in the Spirit, the Bible says, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You can't be in the Spirit and in the flesh at the same time. If you're walking in the Spirit, you can't be walking in the flesh. And if you're walking in the flesh, you can't be walking in the Spirit. They're exclusive one from the other. So you must take repeated steps in the Spirit. I'm going to ask you a question tonight. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty for the power of God? Do you have God's power? Is it, is it missing in your life? Have we become just satisfied with going to church and going through the motions? Or do we want to see God's power at work? Do you have the breath of God? 
Have you been endued with power from on high? There's three things you do. Number one, you ask for it. In Luke chapter 11, you can look there with me. Luke chapter 11, Jesus is teaching His disciples about prayer. This is where He talks, teaches them about not only the model prayer, but then about intercessory prayer and importunate prayer, that consistent, that constant bombarding of heaven to receive what you ask for. And I'm reminded, and I'll remind you tonight, that verse 9 says, ask. And remember, that's not just ask one time, that's ask and ask and ask and keep on asking. Just as this man wouldn't take no for an answer. Three loaves, I need three loaves, I need three loaves. And finally the guy knew he wasn't going to get any sleep. He better get up and give him three loaves. And Jesus said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall knock and it shall be for most of you that ask, receive. No, I'm sorry, some of you that ask, receive. Who is it? Everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth, him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And yet I have people say, yeah, that's true, but you know, don't ask for patience because God will give you tribulation. Is that right? But wait. Look what he says. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? What's the answer? No. If he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? No. What about if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Of course not. If ye then, being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Now I'm asking for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Let me make sure you understand something. When you received Christ your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God came into your life. Your body became the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. He occupies a place inside your body. Okay? It does not mean that He controls everything in your body. It does not mean He fills every area of your life. There are many areas that we still keep control of ourselves, and we don't yield that control to the Spirit of God. So I'm asking for the Holy Spirit here to control me. Now in the context here, what He's saying is this, our partner in prayer is the Holy Spirit. And when we ask God for the Holy Spirit, he, he tells us what to ask God for that we, so that everyone that asks receives. And everyone that seeks finds. And everyone that knocks, it shall be opened unto him. When we ask and we receive not, it's because we ask amiss that we may consume it on our lust. We're not asking with the Holy Spirit's guidance. So we need to ask with the part in the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is there to fill us and it's not wrong to ask for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Yield yourself to the Holy Spirit of God. Romans tells us we're servants to whoever we yield ourselves to obey. You're going to yield to the flesh, yield to the soul, what I want, what I think, what I want, or will I yield to the Spirit? What He tells me God wants, what God says, what God thinks. I must ask for the Spirit to control me. That's a yielding. You, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't take us by force. Go to uh, James chapter 4, would you please? The book of James in chapter 4. Right after the book of Hebrews, it's the book of James. If you get all the way to Peter, you went too far, come back. Again, the context here of prayer in the first few verses. We mentioned verse 3 about ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, ye may consume it on your lust. Verse 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, 
Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So in other words, when I ask amiss that I consume it upon my lust, it's because I'm allowing the world to influence me. What does the world tell us to do? Get what you want. You deserve it. You, you need this. And so I tend to pray that way. And then I don't get what I want. And verse 5 says, Do you think the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. It, it desires to the point of being envious that, listen, that He would have as much influence on us as we let the things of the world influence us. I wonder, you know, it's funny. And I use that in a not a ha-ha way. But you know when there's a ball game on, when Ohio State's playing, and it goes till midnight, I don't have any trouble staying up and watching it. But if you said, Hey, let's pray till midnight tonight, I'd struggle with that. And I wonder if the spirit that dwells in me gets envious that I can sure stay up for a ball game, but I can't stay up to talk to God. That's what he's talking about here. The pull that the things of the world have on us that he doesn't have. That we don't let him have. That's why we got, we got churches. We got big churches but we're not impacting America. We're not impacting our world because there's no power. We have to ask for it. The second thing you do is you wait for it. Jesus told him in Luke 24, the verse we read tonight, tarry ye until ye be endued with power from on high. Hey, from reading Acts chapter 1, how long did they wait? Ten days. We were discussing this the other night with somebody. Might have been Bob and Tanya. We were talking about how, uh, how many times I've heard people say, well, I've really prayed about this. Then they're going to tell you what they've decided to do. And oftentimes I've, I want to challenge that statement. What does really prayed about it mean? Tell me about it. How many meals have you missed praying about it? How many days of fasting and prayer have you spent praying about it? How many hours of sleep have you given up to pray about it? Or do you mean you mentioned it a couple days with God and then you decided to do what you wanted to do? You didn't wait. I dare say most of us have a hard time praying 10 days and waiting for anything. We're in America. We just go get it. Don't have the money? Well, I got a plastic card. We'll just get it anyway. And, and we, we carry that over into our prayer. And God says, listen, the power of the Holy Spirit, God's power in us, God is not going to give that out cheaply. He's going to make sure we're serious about it. He didn't pour it out on them at Pentecost after one day, or two days, or three days, or four days. Do you think any of them after about five days thought, man, what are we waiting on? Everybody's here, all the people are here, let's, let's go talk to them. No, they had to wait. Waiting for the endowment of power from on high. Are you willing to wait? Are you willing to pay the price for God's power to come upon you? Ask for it, wait for it, and then obey God. Look at Acts 5 and verse 32. Acts 5 and verse 32. This is from the Bible. I'm not making this up. Acts 5 and verse 32. P. 
Peter is talking before the council after they've been arrested. And he tells them in verse 29 that we need to obey God rather than men. And then he tells them that God raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree, and that God has exalted Him with His right hand to be a prince and a savior, and to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And then he says in verse 32, we're witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that what? Obey Him. I says, oh, I'll give it to those who ask and those who wait, but you also have to obey Him. Be obedient. God's not going to give His power to a disobedient Christian. You have to be willing to obey. And listen, it's obey without asking what it is first. This morning we mentioned those people in the Bible who said, Here my Lord. And they, they said, Here my Lord, not... Lord, tell me what it is you want and I'll tell you whether I'm going to do it or not. Those are not people who picked and choose what they would obey out of the Bible. But when God said it, that settled it and I'm going to do it. That's what God says. He gives the Holy Spirit to them that obey Him. If we're going to make a difference, Bible Baptist Church, we have to have God's power. There's no way around it. We can't, we can't do it any other way. It cannot be done. To impact our world, to impact our community, we must have God's power. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me. Use me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. There's, a, there's an old song I checked with several people and they did not know it. It's based on those verses from Isaiah about come everyone who is thirsty. Where the Bible says, I'll pour water on him who is thirsty and I'll pour floods upon the dry ground. See, the problem is we have to be thirsty for something other than what we've got. You know, what the, you know what the young people need to see? For them to continue down the path that we'd like them to go down, they want to see God do something. They want to see God's power. The song says, Come everyone who is thirsty in spirit. Come everyone who is weary and sad. Come to the fountain. There's fullness in Jesus. All that you're longing for, come and be glad. I will pour water on him who is thirsty. And I will pour floods upon the dry ground. Open your heart for the gifts I am bringing. While you are seeking me, I will be found. Child of the world, are you tired of your bondage? Weary of earth joys so false, so untrue? Thirsting for God? For His fullness of blessing? List to the promise a message for you. I will pour water on him that is thirsty. I will pour floods upon the dry ground. Open your heart for the gifts I am bringing. While you are seeking me, I will be found. Verse number 3, Child of the kingdom, be filled with the Spirit. Nothing but fullness thy longing can meet. Tis the endowment for life and for service. Thine is the promise, so certain, so sweet. I will pour water on him who is thirsty, and I will pour floods upon the dry ground. 
Open your heart for the gifts I am bringing. While you are seeking me, I will be found. I don't know about you, but I want to be thirsty. I want to be the dry ground that God will pour water out on me. I want you to I want you to have a spirit-filled pastor. I want you to have a spirit-filled preacher. And we need spirit-filled Christians at Bible Baptist Church. Let's not, hey, let's make sure we have what's missing in so many places across our land. If it's missing in your life, will you ask God for it tonight? A fresh endowment of power from on high. David said, Lord, anoint me with fresh oil. Oil was a symbol of the Holy Spirit. David was saying, give me a fresh anointing, God. Maybe that's what we ought to ask for tonight. Heavenly Father, take the truth now this evening. Lord, I pray that You've put a thirst in the hearts of many here this evening. Lord, our thirst tonight is not for more machinery. Our thirst is for the power of God. If Your promise is to pour water on those who are thirsty and to pour the floods upon the dry ground, then Lord, we want to be thirsty. We ask You, to fill us with Your Spirit. We ask You, Lord, to help us to tarry until we're endued with power from on high. We want to witness, but we want to witness in Your power. We want to serve, but we want to serve in Your power. We want to teach, but we want to teach in Your power. We want to give, but we want to give in Your power. Help us to listen and obey You this evening. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'm not going to have a raise of hands tonight. Just going to stand in a moment. Uh, the pianists begin to play and Bob will sing. Find a place at the altar. Find a place at a chair. Just find a place where you talk to God. Just ask God to give you a fresh anointing, fresh oil. I'd be a spirit-filled Christian. I, don't, I want what's been missing in so much of our Christianity today. The power of God. The power of God. Let's ask for the Holy Spirit to come upon us tonight. Heavenly Father, Bless this invitation time. May your will be done in each heart and life. Hear our prayer tonight, Lord. Has some thirsty people cry out to Thee to pour the water of the Holy Spirit upon us. May we see a difference this week as we endeavor to do what we do, not in our power, but in the power and influence of the Holy Spirit of God. Have your way in each heart now, and I'll thank you for it. Quietly with your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand, the pianist will play. As she plays, Bob will sing. God has spoken to your heart tonight. Respond to Him this evening, will you please? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me Lord, take my life 
and make it holy thine. Fill my heart with thy great love divine. Take all my will, my passion, self, and pride. I now surrender, Lord, in me abide. O Holy Ghost, revival comes from Thee. this way just a minute if you would take your songbook turn to 310 would you please 310 we're going to sing this for our closing tonight and uh let's make it our prayer to god okay lord send the old time power the pentecostal power thy floodgates of blessing we'll just do the chorus thy floodgate of blessing on us throw open wide lord send the old time power the pentecostal power that sinners be converted and thy name glorified. That power is in us. The power is the person of the Holy Spirit. He indwells us. And that power needs to be unleashed through us to reach a lost world for Christ. All right? Don't forget to pick up your uh, postcards there in the back. And uh, let's get as many of those out as we can tonight. I'd like to see that table wiped out and uh, get, send them out. That'll be a blessing. And uh, we look forward to a great time. Have a good week. And uh, Lord willing, we'll see everybody Wednesday evening. Let's sing this together as our closing song. All right. Uh, the chorus. Oh, wait a minute. Before we do that. You know what? It's Caleb's birthday. Caleb Moreland. It's not just his birthday. It's his 10th birthday. He's, he's double figures. Where is he? Is he sleeping? No, there he is. Where are you, Caleb? There he is. Ten years old. Man. You're getting big. We ought to sing happy birthday to him, all right? We'll sing happy birthday to him, then we'll sing our closing song, all right? Congratulations, Caleb. You made it to ten. Amen. All right. You're not married yet, are you? Anything? No? Okay, all right. Amen. Let, we're going to sing happy birthday to you, okay? Your church loves you, buddy. All right, you got that, Lisa? There it is. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Caleb. God bless you, buddy. And uh, today is the day, right? Is that right? February 11th? Congratulations, man. That's good. All right. 310. Lord, send the old time power. Let's sing it. Here we go. 
Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power, thy floodgates of blessing on us throw open wide. Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power, that sinners be converted and thy name glorified. God bless you. You are dismissed. Wife said I'm supposed to get, she wanted me to get.